stand for the reading of our gospel. Our gospel today can be found on page 878 in your pew Bibles. John 15, beginning with verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Do we have any children that would like to come forward for our kids' message this morning? Does anybody want to join me? Oh, boy, all right. I'm glad to see you this morning. (laughs) How are you? I'm glad to see you. So, we've been talking a lot about corn lately, and some of the lessons that we learn from being in a cornfield. What are some of the things that help corn grow? or any plant. Do you know how to make a plant grow? Does your mom or dad have any plants at home? Yeah? Have you ever seen what they do to help make them grow? What are some of those things? Do they water the plants? Yeah. Maybe do they put the plants near sunlight so the sun hits them and the sun helps them to grow? Well now, how do people grow? If I watered you and put you in sun, would you grow? No, you need more than that, don't you? You probably need, instead of sprinkling you with water, you probably have to drink water. You probably have to eat some food. Do you like to eat food? The food makes you grow strong, right? Well, here's a really hard question. How do we grow our faith? Faith is an interesting word. Faith is... What we use, that's the word we use to talk about the ways that we trust in God. We trust that God loves us and is always with us. So how do we grow that trust? We can't just pour water on it or stick it in the sun. One of the ways that we grow our faith, that we grow our ability to trust that God is good and gracious, is we, we do exactly what you did this morning. We came to church. We came to church and we pray and we listen to what God's Word tells us. We listen to the words from the Bible where God says, I love you so much. We get to sing songs, and in those songs, we get to have that music wash over us, and we get to hear again that God makes us with purpose, and we get to share that love with people. So we trust that God is the grower of our faith, just like God grows our bodies to be strong, And God grows our plants and our corn so that we can eat them and enjoy the fruits that come from them. Will you pray with me? You're all ready to pray. Your hands are already folded. Good and gracious God, thank you for the strength that you give us. Thank you for the ways that you make all things grow. For the plants that we see around us to our bodies, to our faith. Continue, Lord, to grow our trust that you are always with us, that you are always loving us, that we are your beloved children. 
so that we can go out and share that fruit with others. Amen. I'm so glad you came forward. Thank you. You can go back. Grace and peace to you from God our Creator and from Jesus our Savior and true vine. Or true, yeah, true vine. There's nothing quite like sinking your teeth into a perfectly ripened ear of sweet corn. It's one of the finest pleasures of late summer, I think. And it wasn't until my pastoral internship in Emerson, Nebraska, that I realized the work that went into growing corn, or growing anything. So much has to happen before that moment when you get to sink your teeth into that juicy corn. So much work has to be done. Emerson was a small town, 900 people, 30,000 cows. During my internship, I spent my days following farmers around. These dear people were so patient with me. I sat for hours in the combine with them. I helped them bottle feed baby cows, and I observed how to castrate baby pigs. I think that was actually more traumatic for me than it was for those hogs, but that is for another sermon. I immersed myself in the science and the craft that goes into this lifestyle that is centered on the task of nurturing. Nurturing the land, the seeds, the animals, the community. I was lucky enough one day to go out with a farming family as they planted their fields. Mr. Albright let me drive the planter. Hmm. Boy, was he trusting. And he told me all that I had to do was follow this line, and I would have straight cornrows. Well, anyone knows me that I can, I can get chatty. And during my jibber-jabber, I, I may have veered off my line. And it wasn't until later that summer when I was driving around with this dear farmer that he said, hey, let's go check out your corn. Let's see how it's growing. And I thought, oh my gosh, that is so sweet. He's giving me credit for this corn. He's making me feel like I'm a team player. I'm part of this process. So we get out to the field and he points to the area and he asks, can you tell which are your lines? And it became very clear to me why he was sure to give me credit. <laughs> there was a clear difference between his line and mine. His were straight and mine, let's just say they had a sense of whimsy to them. We both giggled and I sheepishly apologized. And he graciously said, well, you know what? You can, you can get more corn out of a crooked line. He was being nice, of course. I think he was extra glad that it was over a hill that you couldn't actually see from the main road. There truly is a science that goes into making anything grow. A good farmer, a good gardener, doesn't just throw out the seed willy-nilly. I mean, before that seed is ever planted, the soil is nurtured. It must contain the needed nutrients for the seed to thrive. The rocks and the weeds have to be removed. Proper drainage needs to be established, yet the soil still needs to be able to hold moisture. And those straight lines, they do actually serve a purpose. Sure, corn will grow in a crooked line, but those straight lines help you to move between those rows to manage weeds, to harvest the crop, and to manage insects. And after the soil has always been tended to and the seed has been planted, then you get to manage the elements. Corn borers, army worms, earwigs, beetles, grasshoppers, raccoons, deer, bad weather, the work of nurturing anything is full time. But there does come a moment when that gardener or that farmer has to go to bed. When they lay their head on their pillow and they must turn over the growth 
to the one that makes all things grow, the one that is the source of life for all. Our New Testament reading, the Apostle Paul says it so beautifully, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So a lot happens before you get the chance to sink your teeth into a perfectly ripened ear of sweet corn. And we can give thanks for those people who nurture the land and those seeds. And we can also give all the glory to God for making those seeds grow so that we can be enriched by the fruit. Seeds are nurtured to grow in fields and gardens. I also can't help but think of the ways that seeds are nurtured in our daily lives. I believe that the Holy Spirit plants within us the seeds of the Spirit. You may remember learning about these fruits of the Spirit in Sunday school, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are planted in us by the Holy Spirit, and then, as people of God, we are blessed with the task to nurture those seeds for and with one another. It starts with our children. Children that need to be nurtured with this love and care and attention and the right nourishment to grow. We are in the early parts of school here in Owatonna, and I so enjoyed watching all of the first day of school pictures get posted onto Facebook. And this year was a big year for some of my friends. There's this cohort of my friends who have children starting in kindergarten. And this transition to kindergarten is a milestone moment for these families. These once little babies are not babies anymore. This little seed that they've been nurturing at home is ready to go off into a new place to learn, to be encouraged, to grow. I think it is significant that the word kindergarten is derived from the German meaning a garden of children. I love this imagery. All these different little personalities, these little shapes and sizes coming together into a new garden, a new classroom. And just like a well-tended, nurtured, and cultivated garden produces beautiful color and fruit, the kindergarten classroom becomes a place of nurture for those seeds of learning to grow in children. And parents and grandparents and aunties and uncles, I think you can speak to the delight of watching the fruit develop from the learning and the enrichment that your children receive. And while this nurturing of seeds begins when we are young, it never ends for us. And the process of producing fruit, it cannot happen without relationship. Even if we are continually nurtured to bear fruit, we can't make ourselves bear fruit. We are unable to muster up the energy and the power alone. And this is the gift of our gospel lesson today. Using more agrarian imagery, the gospel writer John presents the image of the vine and the branches. The image of the vine is common to us and was even more common to Jesus' disciples and to our gospel writer's community. Grapes, in particular, have always been central to Israel's agriculture and economy. Jesus uses this imagery of the vine and the branches to offer comfort and encouragement to his disciples the night before he dies. And Jesus tells his disciples, you will produce fruit. These are words of promise. For the disciples. Jesus is telling them, you will see me handed over, crucified and died on the cross. Don't worry. Do not despair. You will produce more fruit than you produced while I was with you. You will produce much fruit. So often I think when we hear this, we hear this, these words of Jesus to bear fruit, we immediately hear it as a command. We think, okay, what must I do to bear fruit? What kind of fruit must I bear, and how much do I need to produce? 
And yet when we focus on the fruit, we end up making it all about us. And we get the meaning backwards. Because it's not about us and what we're doing. Rather, it is about God and what God is doing and what God has already done. Bearing fruit is the promise. We can plant. We can water. But God gives the growth. Even Jesus recognizes that without God, he has no life, no ministry, and no mission. In today's image, God is the vine grower, the one who gives the growth. Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches. And because of this mutual abiding together with Christ, because of our relationship, the fruit grows on the branches of its own accord. Therefore, we get the assurance that it's not our job to produce the fruit, but it is our job to remain close to Jesus. And in the closeness with Christ, we get to experience how God's grace and strength brings forth fruit through us. This is how we, the branches, will bear fruit that will bless others. Fruit that will show the world what a community built on love really looks like. After all, for Jesus, the kingdom of God is all about community. It is not about a monoculture. It is about that beautiful garden filled with colors and shapes and smells and yummy foods. A community characterized by living in love and bearing the fruit of love. A community characterized by interconnection and interdependence. There's the African proverb that says it so beautifully, because we are, I am. Well, friends, because Christ is, we are. Only by abiding in Jesus and growing together can we become a community that produces a bountiful harvest, a bountiful harvest for God, the vine grower. And so that's why we continue to gather. It's why worship matters. Together we gather in worship to be fed and to be pruned by God's word. We come to the table as branches to be nourished by Christ, our one true vine. And then like Jesus, we are sent out to share the fruits of the spirit that spring forth in our life. When we abide with Christ, we connect our lives to Christ's life, death, and resurrection, and we become a community that grows more and more into Christ's likeness. And the fruit just happens. Like Christ, we become a community who is kind and welcoming, who is willing to face discomfort together, who navigate through difficulties and disagreements lovingly. We become a community who supports each other, who lifts one another up and lets one another know the depth of our caring. We become a community who shares goals and dreams, a community that can weather storms together with compassion, acceptance, and forgiveness, a community that can laugh, celebrate, and experience joy together. This last week, I attended the Better Together Community Engagement Meeting at the middle school. It was the second in the series, and I was humbled by this meeting, and I left deeply hopeful for our entire community. I saw several of our community later, leaders, business owners, school district members, United Way members, members of the police department. I saw students from the different schools, I saw people who worship differently, who come from different backgrounds and cultures, people with different skin color than I have. And in this diversity and through our conversations, I felt the presence of the Spirit. During our conversations, we explored the questions, who do we want to be as a community? These conversations were nurtured by open hearts, vulnerability and the sharing of life experiences as all the attendees strategized how we can build bridges among the diverse communities within Owatonna. 
and how we can create a sense of belonging for everyone. It was a reminder to me that when relationships are rooted in love and compassion, fruit will grow. When we nurture this type of Christ-centered community, we will experience the promise of bearing fruit, and that fruit is so sweet. In Christ, fruit happens. So let us nurture one another in Christ's abiding love and then trust that God will give the growth. Thanks be to God. Amen.